Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Todd. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have used Julia before? All right, one and a half or so. All right, all right, that's something. Do you guys use Python or R or what is your your main thing? R. All right, a little bit of both. R all right, R and SAS. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so I'll ignore the SAS comment, but also I'll talk about coming from the R world at least a little bit. Um, so I'm Josh. Uh, if you want to follow on with this talk, so I have a little GitHub repo with all my talks, but there's one called uh, Slug 2016 or something. So this talk is already up there if you want to take a look. Um, quick about me, so I'm a fifth year PhD student in stats here at State. Um, I've been using Julia for the last two years or so, uh, mainly for my research. Um, basically, I need to write for loops, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I maintain a couple of packages, uh, with the main one being online stats, uh, which is statistics for streaming data. This is essentially the, the implementation version of my research. So I'm trying to uh, get all the algorithms that I'm working on for my research and putting it into online stats, and then I run a couple other ones, um, just kind of in the meantime. So average shifted histograms. Uh, so that is actually like the first thing I wrote. Um, so it was something that's not in Julia. So it's basically kernel density estimation using a really fine partition histogram, uh, which is something in R under the ASH package. But it doesn't exist in Julia, so I, I spent a weekend you know, writing this package. Uh, it's relatively short, but uh, it's a great way to learn Julia. Um, and if you're looking for projects to work on, there's definitely stuff that is missing. Um, yeah, so if you're looking way to waste a weekend, um, yeah, you could probably find something to, to work on for Julia. All right. So what is Julia? Um, from, their, from the website, they say, Julia is a high-level, high-performance, dynamic programming language for technical computing. Um, so let's talk about what that is. Uh, so Julia is more than just fast R or fast MATLAB or fast Python. Um, so performance comes from a set of features that work really well together. Uh, and the, uh, the developers say, you can't just take the, the magic dust that makes Julia fast and then sprinkle it on R and Python and kind of get the same performance. Um, so one critique was that, like, oh, they should, they could have just, you know, worked on R or Python rather than making their own language. Language and their response is, no, we couldn't have, um, just because R and Python have made some choices that make it really hard to, well, give that information to a compiler, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. So here is a plot of just some benchmarks. Um, so a, a whole bunch of algorithms, and they're they're the t they're made to test, I don't know, uh, certain things that languages typically do poorly. So. Fib uh, is for the Fibonacci sequence, um, and it uses recursive functions, which most languages are really bad at. Um, so it, it isn't an example of how fast can you write a Fibonacci um, function in Julia or R or Python or any of these things. It's basically testing how bad are recursive functions in these languages. So Julia, of course, um, they posted this on the website, so it's going to be the fastest. Uh, and all this stuff is time relative to C. Um, yeah, question. Why don't we use Fortran? Because uh, <laughs> it, have you seen Fortran code before? Yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and so actually one thing they say is Julia is kind of, I don't know, I don't know, the second coming of Fortran in a way where it's like they, they've actually achieved the goals that Fortran set out to do, which was to make a language for scientific computing. Um, so the kind of the goal of Julia is that you can write things that look similar to actual mathematical notation, uh, and then you get this compiled code that's actually fast. Um, so you can write compiled code that's fast in Fortran. Uh, you're just stuck with this really you know messy syntax, and, and things don't look very nice. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure what they used um, for all these things. Yeah. You don't think Python could what? Oh, <laughs> it'd be that fast. Uh, yeah, so I don't know wh what they used exactly for that. Um, anyways, all right, so here's the, the core features um, that they use to get performance out of these things. Um, so they use a JIT, so that stands for just-in-time compiler. So right before something is run, it gets compiled. Um, it has a really great type system. Um, it also uses type inference. So if you've ever written a language like C++ where you have to specify the types of all the objects you're working with, you do not have to do that in Julia because Julia can infer the types of the things that you're using. Um, multiple dispatch, so this is the idea that you can, that functions will evaluate different code depending on the types of the arguments. So we'll talk about more about that. Uh, metaprogramming, so that is writing code that writes code. Uh, and then arguments also pass by reference. 
Um, so you can change things in place in contrast to R. If you write a function and evaluate a matrix, it copies that matrix before it sends it to that function. Uh, or Julia does not do that. So you can change values uh, of the arguments or mutate them in, in various ways. So here is an example of the JIT at work. Uh, so rand n just creates random uh, normal 0, 1 uh, observations. So we calculate 10,000 of those. We can use underscores in numbers just to get separation as opposed to comma. Uh, and so the first time you call a function uh, that is written in Julia, so one great thing about Julia is that a lot of Julia is written in Julia. Uh, so things like the mean function are written in Julia. You're not calling some faster C function. So the first time you call this, and I'm using this macro called time, um, and so this is actually the, one of the most useful things that I've like ever come across. Uh, besides just showing the time that it took that expression to run, it also shows the, the number of allocations and then how much memory was allocated during that function. Um, and if it passes a threshold, it also shows the percentage of garbage collection time. So if you make a, a temporary copy in a function, it tells you uh, how much um, temporary copies you're making. So the first time I call this thing, it does a whole bunch of allocations, um, which seem unnecessary for just calculating a mean, but that's basically this function getting compiled. So then the second time I call this function, it is very fast, uh, and then I don't have to worry about it because it is now compiled in my session. So Julia is dynamic and compiled. Um, so this is showing kind of type inference at work. So I can write a generic function, so just f of x equals x squared, and then I'm using a macro called code LLVM. So LLVM is the name of the compiler. Um, and the details of this aren't too important. Uh, but a 1 by itself is an integer 64. Um, so when I call my function f of 1, um, it is, Julia is compiling a method specific for 64-bit integers. Uh, whereas if I call this function on a float, so 1.0, um, is compiling a method specific for uh, doubles or double precision floating points. Um, so this is really cool, and this is a very simple example, uh, but really I don't have to worry about types unless I want to because Julia is going to compile specific versions uh, depending on the types that I give to these functions. Um, so when you're thinking about types in Julia, uh, think about sets. So float uh, is kind of the bottom of a type tree, and the one set, uh, a larger set of that is abstract floats, and that's within the set of real numbers, which is in the set of numbers, which is in the set of anything. So the, the very top type in Julia is called any. And basically, when you're using things that are any, it's basically do R or do Python, uh, because that is all the information that R and Python get, is that you have some object, but it doesn't really know that it's different than anything else. Um, <clears throat> so at the bottom of every of these trees, there are concrete types, uh, which basically just means there can't be subtypes beneath that. So this is a little bit different than classes in Python. Um, and then everything above it is an abstract type. And so one thing with this is you want to define functions that um, for the least constricting type, so the highest thing in the type, type tree. So this, writing f of x, and now I am giving that type an annotation. Now I'm saying f of x is only going to work with numbers. Uh, and it's fine because every number is able to exponentiate or be able to square itself. Um, and so this is a lot better than writing this function for specifically for floats. Just because we saw before, if I give this function a float, it's going to compile a specific method. Uh, and this is just you know, way too restrictive because I should be able to call this function on, on other types of numbers and it should work. Uh, and again, yeah, so if, you use, if Julia can't infer the type, it treats things as any. So if I have a matrix that includes I don't know, strings and integers and floats, it's going to treat it as any, which is basically do R or do Python. Um, so Julia programs are usually organized around this idea of multiple dispatch. Uh, and this is just saying that functions call different code depending on the types of the arguments that you give it. So there's a lot of focus and a lot of discussion on getting the right, I don't know, grammar or verbs about how to use a certain type. Um, and so you're really focusing on the names of the functions that you're using because you just want this, a really nice, I don't know, syntax and API for describing something. Um, so a really good example of this is a package called distributions. Um, <coughs> and in distributions, um, every distribution is its own type. So there's a gamma type and a normal type and a beta and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so as opposed to R, where if you wanted to calculate the CDF, I think it's p gamma, p normal, and p beta. 
So instead of having these different functions that are doing these different things, really I want the CDF of a gamma, or I want the CDF of a normal, or I want the CDF of the beta. So I'm passing these type objects, and I'm telling I want the CDF of it evaluated at 0.5. And here I'm just doing a, a quick loop through this thing uh, and showing that this works. So this is really cool just because, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of clunky syntax in R because of this focus on, like, you need different functions for every single thing. Uh, so in Julia, it is unnecessary, and you should never do something like uh, p gamma, p normal, p beta, um, just because you should be working on methods. So you, you get the function name that you, you should be working with, um, and then you can define different methods depending on the types that you're giving that. Does this make sense? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, how did they come up with the name Julia? Uh, so there's a, there's a slide on that at uh, one of the guys' talks. And basically, it's a nice name. And that was the whole reasoning for it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but that was the slide of the talk that I went to, was that Julia is a nice name, and that's the whole story to it. Yeah, yeah no, nothing, nothing is yeah, dramatic as that. Um, Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here is showing the power of abstraction. So keeping things generic is typically not extra work, right? So if I want to write a function in terms of numbers, that's just as easy as writing a, a function in terms of float64. Um, so here's a very naive quantile algorithm using Newton's method. Uh, and so univariate distribution is an abstract type that is defined in the distributions package. And I know any concrete type that is a subtype of that is going to have methods for things like mean and PDF and CDF. So before I was defining functions on one line, this is how you define it on multiple lines. And so here I want to give it some distribution, any univariate distribution, and I want to give it uh, some number, some quantile that I want it to get. And then I'm going to initialize it at the mean of that distribution. Uh, and then here is that Newton step, which uses the CDF and PDF functions, and then it goes through this thing. Uh, and then now we can see that, so my function, which I called my quantile, gets pretty much the same results as the built-in quantile function. So this is really cool just because I've only defined this in one place. If I wanted to do this in R, I would have to write this, I don't know, once basically for every distribution that I wanted to cover this for. Uh, so basically, yeah, so this is done in 10 lines. If I wanted to write this function for normals and gammas and betas, I would have to have three different functions in R, um, which is unfortunate. So basically, you get these really cool optimized functions depending on the types, uh, and then you also get shorter code because you're, you're able to use these types um, for optimizations. All right, so here are some macros and metaprogramming stuff. Um, so rand is just calculating uh, random zero, uh, uniform zero one um, observations. So at show is a macro, and I want to get the sum of x. So a quick question of why does this thing need to be a macro? Why can't I just use a function called show? Uh, basically, is if I give if show was a function, it would not be able to see this expression sum of x. Uh, so I need this to be a macro because I want it to take the expression, and then I want it to see that the expression is this thing. If I did show as a function, it would only see what sum of x evaluates to, which is this number, 2.111. So that is a very simple example of, of a macro. Um, so there's definitely a lot more powerful ones. So we saw this at time macro before, which is calculating the time and the allocations. Um, there's also an inbounds macro. Um, so when you do things with um, indexing into arrays, so Julia needs to, to check whether you're trying to index something that doesn't make sense. If you have a length 10 array, uh, Julia needs to check whether you're indexing into the 20th value. Um, and this at inbounds macro actually turns off that checking um, to get a little bit more speed out of things like this. So it's, it's safe if I, so I have an array called x, uh, and now I'm creating a, an iterator called each index, so I know that all the i's are the indices that are available for x. And so I can safely turn off uh, uh, in, uh, index checking um, for these things. And then, so we can see that this actually evaluates. What happens if you turn off the checking, but then go past it? Julia will seg fault, so it'll, it'll crash on you, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not safe, uh, but there are ways to make it safe by making sure you're using this uh, function each index. Um, 
All right, so here is, is an example of Julia using pass by reference. Um, so there's a very good package called Benchmark Tools, um, which kind of it provides this at benchmark macro. Um, basically, it gets rid of things. So like the first time you call a function, it has to compile. Um, this macro is smart enough to kind of ignore that run uh, and do a number of other, other things that give you some statistical guarantees um, on the timing of functions. So I'm creating two um, kind of big matrices. Um, so 50,000 by 500, um, and if I just copy B by itself, I should have written A equals copy B. So let's do something like this. So the benchmark macro will run this thing a whole bunch of times, and then it will give you yeah, some very summary statistics on how it runs. So you have to put the underscore for long numbers? That you don't. That's just for clarity. Yeah. Oh man, I don't remember taking this line. Okay, there we go. So if I just say A equals a copy of B, um, so the minimum is actually a, a, probably the best estimate of how long something takes. Uh, and so we can see that if I copy B in place into a pre-allocated matrix A, so it's about four times faster um, than if I were just to copy this. Um, so this is really cool just because in R you are not able to do something like this. Well, you can. There are ways around it, but it's, it's messy, um, and it's not obvious. Uh, whereas in Julia, um, you're passing things by reference, so you're able to do things like this. And then functions end in an exclamation mark um, just by convention. It's not enforced uh, if they're mutating the arguments, which is, just kind of serves as a warning that you're changing your arguments by calling that function. Uh, another cool feature in Julia is that you can call BLOSS uh, directly. So BLOS stands for basic linear algebra subprograms. So in R or Python or whatever else you use, if you have a matrix times a matrix or a vector, it's just really just calling BLOS, uh, which is typically Fortran. Um, so I'm just doing something simple here. So I want to do A times a vector X plus a vector Y. So in BLOS, this is called XP. Um, and so if I were to just do this like I would in R, or I mean, you could do this in Julia or anything else, um, I can calculate this by itself, or I can use the BLOS function axpy, uh, and then this is overwriting the results into y. And so we see, yeah, so the minimum of this is yeah, 233. Actually, you don't know what that uh, unit is. It's not milliseconds. But anyways, so the Julia version is, I don't know how many times faster that is, 15 or so. Yeah, so you can get very huge speed ups just by avoiding memory allocation. Um, and that's basically because this is creating a temporary vector that is 0.5 times x, and then it's adding that temporary vector to y. Uh, 